Welcome back to the Small Business Safari. Let's go make it happen. Once again, everybody, we're going to go make it happen. But hey, if you're listening, go out there and give us a follow. And if you're not following, maybe you can go have your friends follow, your dad follow, your mom follow, your kids follow. You know, even get your dog to follow. I mean, somebody, just follow me, man. We follow us. We're doing some great things. Get follow us on YouTube. We got a great YouTube channel out there. The thing is popping, by the way, uh, Alan. It is crazy. Is it is it top five percent like like everything else? No, it's not tied for five percent yet, but we're on our way. We're having okay. fun. Guys, ladies and gentlemen, we are ready to rock and roll. We're gonna talk to a great guest today. Uh done some research on Ron Reich, and he is gonna come on and talk to us a lot about leadership culture. And but uh he's got a lot of stuff he wants to talk about culture and leadership and development. But before we do that, what he doesn't know is I got to ask questions because he started out as a sales trainer and I want to hear more about his sales training experience because I think for a lot of us, uh, there are three schools. Okay. There is a, a that's Carnegie, the, the Carnegie sales method two, and two, the Sandler sales method. And then there's C me winging it, baby. That's how I sell my business in the trusted <laughs> toolbox, winging it. So no, we actually use uh, we have implemented the Sandler sales uh, tactics at our at our uh, company. But I'm interested to hear how how you did sales training and what you did. What method did you teach? Uh, when I when I first started, I was a believer in spin selling, and I I liked it. It it made sense to me at the time. It it still does. And as I went through, as I, as I got more and more experience, I went through the best sales training course ever. And it was, and, and again, I'm, I'm sorry, Chris, I, I'm not going to remember the name of the course itself. The book was called Let's, let's, let's Play or, let, or let's, let's Not Play at All. It, it was so, something along those let's lines. Let's get real. Let's get real. That's it. That's yep. it. Thank you. Thank I actually, you. Uh, I actually That's had to read it. that book at Accenture back in the day for yes. uh, B2B sellers. Yes. It let's was, get uh, real and let's not play at all by Mahan Khalsa. That's it. That I'm is it. Right. I don't want to throw a curveball in already, but for those of us who are uneducated like you guys, give us a, a little bit of a, what are the nuances between Carnegie and Sandler and, and this one? Well, I'm going to let Ron do it because he did training of sales for a lot longer than I have because I was winging it. Wait a, for... wait a dish. <laughs> you throw it all the name, you're, you're name dropping and you don't know what it is. You know, well, it's, 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 it, guys, it, it, it's interesting because I, you know, I, I, I use this method in my consulting now. And I mean, what I love about it so much is that it is just all about questions, 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 questions and I'm not, and, and again, I, I still remember the facilitator of this session, David Markham, said over and over and over, you are not permitted to say one word about your company, your product, or yourself until you know everything about your client. Because otherwise, how do you know what you're saying is important? That's that's a great line. Just, uh and I remember that same sales, but it's all coming back to me now because uh, we use a lot of that, even in the home services sales that we do, is that we have to live sometimes in that world of you don't know what you don't know. And what you don't know is what their biggest pain point is, right? Well, and and, and you know what? And, and again, Chris, you're reminding me of this stuff that it's just the way my mind works instantly. I mean, that, that, that's exactly right. And if I don't find out what's important to the client, I'm going to talk to you about what I like. And what's important to me, which is not the point. And I mean, you know, you know, with, with, with the toolbox and so forth, many, many years ago, after my, after my wife's aunt died, we were responsible for selling the home. And I, for some bizarre reason, we tried to do it on our own. And I know it, this was many, many years ago. And that's the, the point I'm trying to make. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What you don't know is that uh, Ellen is a commercial real estate agent. Later. <laughs> <laughs> the, the point I'm making, though, is that my wife's cousin was there, too. And as people were coming to the open house, she was just saying to them, and I, I remembered it instantly, and I remember it to this day, let me take you into the bedrooms. Let me show you the kitchen. And now I want to show you. And I was like, 
let's ask them what's important in a house first. Might have been the backyard. So take them to exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Because I learned that one, I learned that one the hard way. I, I, Chris, I'm sure I told you this story once, but back in my enterprise corporate days, and I think I just got my first big promotion to area manager, had my first company car, and I all of a sudden I see this insurance agent's office I'd never seen before, and I'm like, well, I'm going to go, you know, tell him what's what about enterprise, and I went in and I launched into my best sales pitch I've ever given to this day in anything. I mean, I could tell I was on my A game, and it turns out he didn't insure automobiles, had, no, had nothing. I, that's great, Alan. I just insure boats. And I mean, and I had given him 15 minutes to just like my, just the best gold I'd ever delivered. That's awesome. So never did that again. I like questions now, Ron. Questions yeah. are good. Well, and, 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 and guys, again, going, going back, you know, I am also a voracious reader. I love to read and one of my favorite quotes relative to leadership, and really what we're talking about here is that leaders don't give the best answers. Leaders ask the best questions. Gold nugget. There it is. From right Ron. There. Boom. Ron drops one already. Ask yeah. great questions, get better answers. Right. Those, those, but those, no, but how about doing it as a leader? <laughs> yeah. I, I yeah. ask great questions and I only get better <laughs> answers. Whoops. Sorry. Ron's going to coach me later. All right. <laughs> you really shouldn't use crayons when you're taking notes chris I, you know it's uh it's the only way i know how to write alan but there's 64 great colors in that box. Are, do you have the sharpener in the back <laughs> of course i do all right right let's talk a little bit more so you you uh in your career you uh obviously did a lot of sales training helping people and then it morphed into culture and leadership development um yeah. was that Based on experience, uh, did you decide to leave the corporate world and start into your consulting practice? Talk to us a little bit about how you started that. You know, it, it, it was interesting because, guys, what I'd like to do, if you don't mind, I'll take you all the way back because it's an interesting story. I started all those years ago in human resources and, you know, went, went through and you know, worked for a bank and, you know, had some good stuff going on. The banking industry all those years ago had so many mergers that a number of, there were five of us that left and opened our own consulting firm, an HR consulting firm. We did well for a number of different reasons. After about six, seven years, we decided to close the doors. At the time, I was going through an uncomfortable divorce. Things were not going well in any area. I moved back in with my mom and dad because I had nowhere to go. Trying to think to myself, what do I want to do? You know, I'm 33. Where do I want to go? And I had always had in the back of my mind, I love training. Um, you know, I mean, I've done a little bit of it. I enjoy it and so forth. Out of nowhere, I get a telephone call from a recruiter in Dallas, Texas, who tracked me down in New Jersey at my parents' home. I've got a job with Toshiba. It is the exact opposite of what you are. They're looking for somebody who has a lot of training and some HR. You have a lot of HR and some training. I will get you in front of them. Your job, Ron, is to get them to flip their competencies. I talked to them. They flipped the competencies. I got into sales training, and I've never looked back for the last 30 years. So and, I, I got to ask a question, Ron. When you're, Did your mom answer the phone, and did you tell her to... <laughs> Really mom, exactly. meatloaf, yeah. meatloaf, mom. Yeah, that's like, and I, I did say that to my parents when I was there. It was like, will you please let me answer the phone? <laughs> right. <laughs> if you answer the phone, goes to say HR Ron, consulting Ron, headquarters, yeah, Rod's office. Ron's office. Help you? And, 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 you know, I, I, I will pull the story through, though. And, and this is something of which I'm very proud is that I, first of all, I did not know at the time how unbelievably high the bar was at Toshiba. These people were so good. Hmm. And I mean, just so good. Tony Codiani, who's gone now, was unbelievable. The best boss I've ever had in my career, Barbara Fulmer, was my boss. They saw, you know, the sales training was where I was. They saw something in me that I didn't see in myself and helped me to grow and, and just saying, hey, would you like to get into sales management training? And, you know, the, you know, the course that we offer, and it evolved from there. 
And ultimately what ended up happening, you know, years later, I was working for a pharmaceutical company, got laid off and just started to think about, you know what? I, I don't know how many certifications I have now. It's a lot, 15, 16, 17, what, whatever it is. And I was like, I can take this out on my own and I can make a big difference. And, and, and I know, I know it's cliche. And I say this to people all the time. I said, Ron, you know, what, what is it you want to do? And I want to make a difference. I, I love that. That is so important to me. And I mean, it, 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 it brings me incredible satisfaction. And I do make a difference, which is wonderful. Uh, that's great. I heard the dog barking in the background. It threw me off. Yeah, dog, so, dog is uh, affirming he, Ron. He, 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 was, he, he was affirming <laughs> Ron. I love that. The dog saying, can I get a whoop whoop? All right. Thank you, Ron. <laughs> All right. So you started out on your own to do this consulting work. You know, for a lot of us uh, who the left corporate America, either we wanted to or didn't want to, but off we go and we start a business. Uh, you know, a lot of times we don't have a chance to plan for it. Did you come out into your consulting business with clients in hand? Did you have to go knock on doors and let's get no, real and no, let's not play? No, no clients in hand. And it, it took a while in order to get going and about i mean the first year was tough the second year was better and after that it just took off i mean it really really just took off and i mean pre-pandemic i was at a point where i was as busy as i wanted to be and again i was having a lot of fun things were going well pandemic hit and you know the rug got pulled out from underneath me and for a number of different reasons, I was not interested in doing the Zoom training or the online. For, again, for a number of different reasons. That's not who I am. And, and there, there's some other stuff we don't need to get into. None of it's sorted, I promise you. All right. Yeah, I was going to say, wait a minute. This is a, no, I'm kidding. It's not a family <laughs> podcast because I swear too much. But keep going. Yeah. And I mean, and again, my, my point is, though, things are picking up again. And I mean, I'm getting busy again, and it's it, it's just a joy. I mean, I you know, I I was with a client yesterday, where, you know, a very small manufacturing firm here in New Jersey, and did I did essentially, if you will, a keynote address for them, where we spent the day together, and you know, we 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 went through emotional intelligence, and I took them through the disc instrument. Oh yeah, all all of them. At the end, it's like, Ron, this was just a fabulous day. Thank you. And I mean, you know, and where I go with this, too, is that my sweet spot tends to be the smaller, mid-sized firms, because number one, I'm by myself. And number two, I'm able to establish those strong relationships with people. And it's also been my direct experience, as it was yesterday and with some other current clients as well, is that they're not aware of the kind of training and information that's out there that can make such a difference. I was just going to say, the smaller companies don't have the internal training and, uh, you know, educational models and, and things like that, that they can work with their people. So to bring you in, it's just all like, Oh, wow. It's like a caveman with fire probably. Right. Yeah. yeah I'm yeah, sure it's like that. True. Well, on the business side of this though, I'm interested in how do you get your name out to these folks? Cause I mean, is it CEOs and COOs who are actively looking for this or is this something you're out there pushing? Obviously you're on the podcast today. We're talking to you, getting that information, yeah. but as a business owner, how are you finding those leads and getting this work? I have, I have been, I, I've been on a lot of podcasts and that's been a lot of fun. And, you know, and again, real, uh, getting back into the leadership piece of it, you know, I, I realized as, as the pandemic ended, and I, I say this proudly, first of all, I am very good at what I do. I have a lot of fun with it. I'm good at it. And I'm proud of that. One of the things good leaders need to know too, are the things at which they're not as good. And I realized I don't know how to market myself that well. And so I've hired a marketing coach and I've been working with Elaine for a num for a while now. And she's been extraordinarily helpful for me. You know, I mean, I, you know, she's, I, I've known her for many years and she's a friend, 
And she's also just a wonderful coach. She's helped me with the podcasting. She's helped me with getting newsletters out there and, and really learning more about how to use LinkedIn and just everything else. So again, turn, you know, turning to people who know more than I do about a particular subject and with marketing, I need some help. Yeah, no, that's a, that's excellent. I think that's a great gold nugget right there too. Know what you're good at, know what you're not good at, hire for your weaknesses and strength and, and just play on your strengths and develop that and double down on that, right? What do you have most call for? Uh, sales training, leadership training, or management training? And I notice I differentiated between those last two. Uh -oh. It is. Tread the, lightly the here, Ron. The work that, that I'm doing is in leadership. I, have, I haven't done any straight sales training in a lot of years now. Although I still consider it, you know, even the leadership training is sales training. You know, I mean, you, you are trying to influence people. You're trying to get things done through other people. I mean, you know, you, we need to sell the culture. We need to sell the new venture. We need to sell you know, just all of these different things. So, I mean, there are tie-ins everywhere. So, Ron, uh, you, Chris and I, actually, before you came on, we were having a little bit, uh, we were on a different side of this topic because I kind of think that you're either a leader or you're not. And if you're a natural leader, you can be trained to be a great leader. If you're not a leader, you can be taught leadership skills, but you may not be a leader. And Chris, on the other side of things, he, he says, no, I think you can be taught to be a leader. What do you, what do you say to that? Let's say you run. Settle this argument. Chris is wrong, right? Well, no, hang on. Let Ron talk, please. I think everyone has some in different levels of innate leadership skills. I do believe that. I also believe extraordinary, as, as strongly as I can that these skills are, you know, they're, they're learnable, they're teachable. If they weren't, I wouldn't be in business. So, That's I mean, a good I, point. You know, I, th I think you 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 can teach people to be a leader. I think a lot of it too is instinctual. And you know, in, in interestingly, uh, I'll go back. I was I was I was talking to uh, was uh, not the client yesterday. It was uh, someone the week before, I believe. Whatever. John Maxwell. Uh, I, I've read quite a bit of of his uh, of his work in his book, Leadership Gold. I read the foreword, and very, very rarely do I read the forewords in the books. For whatever reason, I just don't bother. I did hear what he wrote. I hope you don't learn too much from this book. And I was like, huh, that's odd. <laughs> and he continued, what I'm hoping is that you are already doing what I talk about in the book instinctually. My goal for the book is to put a framework around what you're doing so you can call it something. That makes sense to me. I like, I that. like that. Yeah, that's a great, that's a, that is a great forward. And you're right. I do the same thing. Forwards, ah, they get in my way. It's too forward for me. I have to keep going. All right. <laughs> that's why. So I, obviously, uh, definitely a big reader. And we've hit so many topics. I'm trying to figure out which one I want to dive, dive into, but I'm going to go pick the disc profile. So do, how do you use the disc profile in your training to help teams understand themselves better? Well, first of all, uh, my opinion, and I have shared this with, with people over the years, I think the DISC is the best instrument on the market. I really do, for the following reasons, and this is how it helps to build teams. Number one, it is steeped in research. It is phenomenally accurate, phenomenally. It is easy to use. It's easy to understand, and it is incredibly useful. And I mean, I think, you know, for, for me, the key, the key comment that I just heard, it, it, if, you want, if you want to be the best leader possible, you want to be the best person possible, let's keep it the leadership. What I always say to people, get to know yourself extraordinarily well. Because the better you know yourself, the more effectively you will work with other people. And the DISC is a tremendous instrument to start that process on a deep level, on a very deep level. And, you know, it goes back to what we were just saying before. It helps people understand these are the things I do well. 
I'm detail oriented, I'm factual, or I'm, I'm, you know, I'm more people oriented and I'm fast paced. I need to be around people. Yeah, again, whatever it might be. And it helps you to know yourself, allowing you then to work more effectively with others. In, 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 in fact, what was, what was so interesting, I'll give you an example. Yesterday, uh, I, we, we, were actually, we were actually talking about strengths and limitations of our profiles. And I was talking with one of the participants and he said to me, I was like, so what, you know, what, what's one of your limitations work-wise? And he was like, oh God. He said, I am, I am just so, I'm very, very detail-oriented, which is good. He said, I hate taking those details and then having to present them. It drives me crazy. I get so nervous and I get, it's awful. And I was like, okay, this is how you, if you and I were to work together, we could collaborate beautifully. You do the research. I'll do the presentation. Right. There we go. And he was like, hey, that's really good. <laughs> I, like, I love that. Disc. <laughs> yeah, no, I agree. I'm a, I'm a big believer in DISC. All my people in my company have used DISC. And uh, I use it for uh, communication. Uh, I use that to develop my leaders, Alan. Mm -hmm. uh, your because you can. No, they lead. Okay, no. they're managers. But no, I'm kidding. But uh, it's been very helpful for me, and I, I agree with you uh, 100%. It's, uh, it's easy to use, uh, simple to understand. There's a lot in it. So you yeah. can pick off as much or as little as you want, but it directionally gets you much better in understanding how to best communicate with people. And, and that's what I have found over the years as well. Yeah. little disc trivia. You know what else the, the founder of the disc profile invented? No. Lie detector test and Wonder Woman. Wonder Woman? Yeah, look it up. I'm more excited about that. <laughs> I know I'm actually. I'm, uh, <laughs> and he's writing it down. What color Wonder, crayon are you using for Wonder, Wonder Woman? Woman? She gets a. She gets full. Yeah, I'm gonna write that down too. <laughs> <laughs> I, I love it. One of the things I know you're passionate about uh, is culture, and so let's talk about that because that's a big one for me. I, you know, I'm a big believer that you have a culture in your company, whether intended or unintended, and you need to understand the culture as a leader in your company uh, right. to understand what to best do. So. Talk to us a little bit about what makes a good culture, what makes a toxic culture, what uh, the different. What? How do you measure them? I think you. Can, I think you can. You can. You can measure that for me, based on the engagement of your of your team, and and just of your organization. And this is where again, you need you need from my perspective. If you really want to get the best information, bring an outside consultant in. Let the consultant talk to the people at the organization, find out what they're thinking about, how they feel about things, because you know it's so often we you know we had those different we did those different views of things, and, and again I, I am working with a company right now on on building an intentional culture, yeah they a, a family owned business. And, 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 and actually, guys, you know what, what, what's interesting here? Let me, let me take it back because I had, I had spoken with them. I was, I was referred to them uh, by a friend saying, oh, they need, they, they need leadership training or they, you know, they need management training. It's like, okay, fine. So I got on a Zoom call with the, uh, with the COO and one of the vice presidents. And they're talking about, well, this is, this is what the staff needs and this is what's going on here. And it was very clear to me. And I was like, guys, you know what? Time out, time out. I can tell already they need training. They do. Before we do anything, we need to sit down because you and the senior leaders need some training. We need to talk about culture. Family owned business. It's been around for years and years and years. And they said to me, things have become lax. You know, people are just sort of doing their own thing. We've grown and it's just, it, it's just A doesn't know what B is doing and C is doing his own thing and, and just all of that. And over, uh, over the past month or so, we've met on a number of different occasions. We have come up with what's called a culture statement for the organization. We have four values that we came up with defined as the company sees it, not the classic definition defined as the company sees it. And what we need to do next 
and this is and this is where the commitment needs to be. You need to have the commitment from the senior leaders, because what I'm going to do is take the senior leaders through the actual training itself. I'm going to take them through emotional intelligence, the DISC instrument, delegating effectively, how to give feedback, how to listen, all of these different things. Once they've gone through it, it's at that point, then we bring it down to the rest of the organization. And I mean, it's a big commitment and it's, yeah, it's well, hard well, well worth the time. Culture, <clears throat> I mean, to change culture is brutal because whether you like it or not, there's a culture. It just may not be a good one. And so you can decide, you can, you can committee all you want on what you want your culture to be, but it, it may not roll downhill. Sure. Yeah, so here are our values. Live yeah. them. Okay. Now let's. <laughs> right. Right. One, one of our values is honest and open communication. Now shut up and get back to work. <laughs> That's right. exactly That's right. right. Exactly. I'm not saying that I might've said that today. It seems like that came pretty natural. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, culture statement on that one. I uh, very interesting. You you hit on something that I wanted to ask you about as well, and that is, as leaders, uh, a lot of times we're unfocused, and sometimes we can mislead uh, people. What do you find that uh, the, are some of the bigger weaknesses of leaders as you've been working with other companies? Sometimes I, I think I, I think my experience has been they they they. they don't treat their people as human beings. Is that they, they see them as cogs rather than uh, humans. And I mean, it, 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 and, an, old, an old boss of mine said to me one time, he said, never, never, never use the word subordinate because no one is subordinate to you and no one is subordinate to me. They are your colleagues. They are your co-workers and you know it, it was it was interesting because going back to that organization where we're working with the culture one of the employees kept using the word superiors i you know i go to my superiors with this and my superiors tell me and i was like tiffany is there a reason you keep using that word because it's coming up over and over and again my my point is simply that we all need to work together. Yeah, there are people at different levels, and I get that. And there's no doubt. Come on, let's you know, be honest with each other here. There's hierarchy, and there's power involved. And, and again, at certain points in time, there's nothing wrong with that. Except, you know, one of the big... Actually, let me ask you guys. You know, I'll throw a question to you, if I may. What do you think the biggest reasons are people become unhappy at work? Oh, boss holes. <sighs> Was I too quick? I don't know. You know, the so. fact I'm that sorry. You, <laughs> Chris wants to be called Lord of all I survey. I mean, I, is that, I do, is well, that bad? We, we do have a, we do have a moment of silence every time I come into the office. Oh, that's right. uh, I ask for everybody, please bow down. Rose I, I have begun the day. Thank you, everybody. Please continue on. You are now allowed to go back to your little work that you're doing at your little computers <laughs> and you go work on your little spreadsheets and I will go off to my throne and I will start to eat grapes and talk to everybody. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think people, people need a sense of purpose, Ron. I think they need to be uh, valued purpose. Yeah. You know, I, I used to sum it up very simply, you know, to be happy in your job, you either need to be making a lot of money or having a lot of fun, but I like to have a lot of fun making a lot of money. Ooh, see, that's a good line. For, for, really? See, for, for me here, guys, I, 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 I agree. The, the number one reason people become unhappy, based on the research of, um, of which I'm aware, is their relationship with their boss. Number yeah, people two, don't quit their company, they quit their boss. There's yeah. no doubt about that. People yeah. leave people. They don't leave companies. Mm -hmm. Number two, their relationship with their coworkers. Third, lack of recognition, lack of respect. And, what, and the key point, though, is there's no separation between those three. In other words, people become unhappy with their boss because he or she is not providing enough recognition to his or her direct reports or not enough respect. And it's the same thing with coworkers. And you know, it, it, it's something I try to emphasize to people. And, and, and candidly, I get frustrated sometimes because, you know, 
you know, pe people buy the concept. They do. I can tell. You say, oh, yeah, this is really important. I can tell. And then you, you talk about it months later. You go visit months later, and it's not happening. And, yeah. and when, I, when I say recognition, for me, it's the simple, simple stuff. Chris, thank you for staying late last night and, and, and finishing the presentation. I really appreciate that. We're, we're, we're going to get you. We're going to get you more involved in some leadership training because I know that's of interest to you. We're going to design your job so that you can leave on time because I know you have a new baby at home. You know, whatever, whatever it might be. And and again, the, the, one of the key things here, it's so so simple, is that because everybody is so different. I always say to them is that, how do you know that when, that when you're recognizing somebody, it's important to them? How do you know? It's back to the like, questions oh, thing. Everybody likes, you know, just ask them. Just ask right. them. What's important to you? And it changes over time. So you need to continue to ask. So hypothetical, then, hypothetical situation, Ron, if you're just on vacation all the time, like in Cabo or Tahoe, or how, how do you provide that kind of recognition uh, virtually or from a long distance. Let's just let's just say, it, for example, if your name rhymes with Chris. <laughs> All right, how about this? So I just because I asked the question is uh, one of my handymen said I need a week off for paternity leave, and I went paternity leave. Is that the right question, or should I said I highly respect the Can fact you that be you're more saying, incredulous? <laughs> I did. Not. I did. I did. I, I let him. Uh, you're right. Uh, younger people, especially, and I'm uh, putting us all in the old category. Um, Ron, you hit on it. Sometimes it's not more money. In fact, a lot of times it's not more money. It's it's more recognition and more understanding of what they want. And so one of my younger handymen said, I'd like to stay home for a week. Uh, can I have paternity leave? And uh, I ended up, I, I gave it to him. And in, in the handyman world, this is construction, blue collar work. Yeah. And I did it. And it uh, this guy has now been with me uh, for two years. Nice. Yeah. So uh, I, I get it. I mean, you're right. Is um, I think one of the best lines, and I, I've been dying to put this one out there. We just learned this one earlier this year. We have to not be human doings. We have to be human beings. Like that? I have to think about that for a minute. I, it's just so you like that? It did. It resonated with me because he's right. I mean, I'm in there, you know, wheeling and dealing, running a business, um, or uh, or going to those hypothetical places that somebody <laughs> might have mentioned earlier. Uh, but we're busy. And sometimes when we're busy, we forget to recognize people. So one thing that all those people in my company will appreciate is that the fact that I took an hour out of my day to talk to Ron today uh, is I'm going to go in there and think a little bit more tomorrow. Yeah. And, you know, some, sometimes it, it can be as simple as just chatting with people. I, you know, I, I remember a pharmaceutical company and I was fairly new. I had been on board very new, actually, maybe, you know, six weeks, whatever. And it was right around this time of year because at the U.S. Open, uh, was taking place, and I knew my boss was a big tennis fan, and I and I, I I am too, not as much as I used to be, and, that, and that's not the point. I walk, It was very early in the morning. We, we both used to get in early. I walked by his office, and just said, to him, "I was like, hey Joe, did you see the match last night?" He looked at me, and with with just like I, it's not fair to say fire in his eyes. Still, I'm busy, and I was just like. You got to be kidding. Right. Got to be kidding. I mean, a simple, did you see the match last night? It's 730. Nobody's here. And I mean, you know, maybe you are busy. Maybe you're working on something to not even be able to just acknowledge. I, and, and, I, I, I'm talking about it to this day. So clearly it made an impact on me negatively. Yeah, it did. There you go. And just one action leaves a big ne negative impact. What was his name again? He's a tool. Yeah, yeah. I'll leave that one. <laughs> yeah, let, we'll get the name out. You're in Jersey. Uh, Ron, Ron's in Jersey. Hey, we know some people in Jersey. Last name's La Lamia here. You know what I'm saying? I don't know. I got some things to say. Okay, no. Ron, we've enjoyed this conversation. But before we uh, go into our famous four questions, how can everybody get a hold of you to learn more about how to help themselves and their culture, small to medium businesses? Go check this guy out. Uh, I checked him out on LinkedIn, but how can we all find you? The, the best way to do it is through LinkedIn. Just, you know, Ron Reich, R-E-I-C-H, R-L-B, Training and Development. And, uh, yeah, you know, ch check the site out. And, and again, gentlemen, 
sincerely as I say, it, it, I mean it sincerely. Anybody wants to, to contact me, I welcome a conversation. And Pick I them up on it, guys. Anybody. Hit them up on LinkedIn. You know what? I say that all the time. You you guys have listened to me, and and it happens. I just got another uh, another email yesterday saying, hey, thanks again. Can you spare 30 minutes with me to talk to me about my business? And Ryan, you can tell he's sincere as well. And uh, so hit him up, man. Talk to him a little bit. You know, no, no sales pitch. He's just going to talk to you for a little bit. The man and knows he, what he's talking about, too. He can definitely. He's picked on some, a lot of great stuff here so far. All right, Ryan, we're coming to the end and we've got to get our four questions and we'll do them rapid fire, but we're going to get them going because I know you've got like a million books you've read, but what is a favorite book that you would recommend to somebody that you've recently read? I changed it up a little bit. You did change it up. Does it, it, All right, your favorite book ever then. No, 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 no. Uh, a book you would recommend. Is, I'm sorry. I was going to say a book you'd recommend to somebody who's thinking about starting a business or is new in business. You know what? I'm, you know what? I'm I'm, I'm going to link it into what we've been talking about relative to culture. The best the best book I have read about that is called The Advantage, uh, written by Patrick Lencioni. Uh Fabulous. He he talks in the book so much about culture, what it is, what it isn't, and he says, and I believe him too. And I, not not I believe him. I like it. He said, every organization in this country is smart. Everybody, every, every company has smart people. The problem is most of these organizations are unhealthy. And they're unhealthy because of politics, toxic cultures, and those sorts of things. I won't get, I won't get into all the details. He talks a lot about, though, and gives wonderful suggestions and tools about how to go about addressing and building a solid culture. I love the book. That's a great recommendation, man. You've hit so many of my favorite authors, Maxwell and Sioni. Uh, the Mahan Khalsa book, that's great too. Um, but now we have to talk about houses because I love houses and that's why I'm in this business that I do. What is the favorite feature of your home? You will, you, I, I, I'm certain, I hope you will love this because about five months ago, whatever it is, we finished a enormous kitchen renovation and house renovation. And the favorite feature that I have within the kitchen is the, is, is the big window in the back. Because what it allows us to do is to see our entire backyard where we couldn't see that before. And what, what I link that into as well, again, from a leadership perspective, the balcony view is that I can see the entire backyard and see the big picture. I can see, I can see the trees. I can see the bushes. It's a metaphor. And I apologize oh, I get it. for the barking. We can see her running around and chasing squirrels out there and that kind of stuff. So it's a fabulous feature. Awesome. What kind of uh, cook range did you put in your kitchen? Are you guys cooks? What? Yeah. Oh, my wife's a wonderful cook. All what right. Kind of what kind of range, what kind of cooktop did you guys put in? Gas? Yeah, oh, it's gas. Yeah. Yeah. Name brand? Oh, no. Bosch. Oh, nice. <laughs> nice. Oh, yeah. Al and I are both big cooks, so I love hearing about the, when it, yeah, anybody, my, my anybody brings so up a cool. kitchen, but I love that. You're and, right. And when you open up the I, back I, of the I, house. You have to say I'm, I'm not allowed to use the stove. <laughs> Hey, good job. You know your strengths. And we just figured out who the leader in your home is. So we're going to keep that going. With that. The wife is a high D. Yes. I think we just figured that out. Yep. Okay. Yeah, it's exactly right. <laughs> Kudos, my friend. That was good. Well done, Alan. All right. We are uh, we're big into customer service because we are customer service freaks. Let's go. What is a customer service pet peeve of yours when you're out there and you are the customer? You know, I, I was thinking about this. You know, I, I, and for me, I think it's inconsistency. Hmm. That, that drives me crazy. And, and, a, and, and what I mean by that, too, is that if you make me a promise, I expect you to keep it. You know, as you say, as a, hey, I will be there. You know, the, the classic thing by four o'clock. Okay, fine. Be here by four o'clock. My my mom. Uh, it, it it'll be three years. What in a on a Saturday? Saturday it'll be three years. She died. Hmm. She when she was in the hospital, we we needed some help, and I needed to talk to the social worker. 
And I was on the phone with her internally within the hospital. Ron, I'll be there within an hour to talk to you. First thing I do, guys, I promise you, I look at my watch. I expect you here in an hour. She didn't show up for an hour and 40 minutes. And I was like, what's going on? You promised me. I've got other things to do here. You know, my mom is so sick. I need you to keep your commitments to me. And that, that drives me insane on any level. Yeah. Inconsistency is, it's a hallmark. Even if you do something really well and you come back behind, do it bad, and then come back and do it again well, people don't like it. You got to have the same. It's, the, it's the old uh, over-promising and under-delivering yeah. or telling people what they want to hear rather than what they need to know. I mean, it's, yeah, very, very good one. All right. You're fresh off a kitchen <laughs> renovation. And so now I got to ask my last question. And that is, give us a DIY nightmare story. I'm not, I'm not going to give you a D the do it yourself. If you don't mind, I have a contractor nightmare and it, it does tie into what we've been talking about. These, we, we hired these guys to re not to redo our basement, to do a lot of work on, on the basement to, to, they needed some refurbishing and some other things. Fine. They came in as a, Hey, you know what? We can do some other things. We can do some painting for you. And then and, and just, again, just some other things. And after they started, we realized these guys don't know what they're doing. They just don't know what they're doing. And, you know, we talked to them about it. We tried to go down the nice route with them. It didn't work out well. Attorneys got involved and it was ugly. It was yeah. ugly. ugly. And, you know, I mean, and again, it just, yeah, I, I don't need to get into the details. Well, on that note. So on that note, talking to a contractor who's sitting there going, is he doing his job? Right? How do you feel about attorneys, Chris? Oh, we don't want to talk about attorneys, especially not in construction. No. All right. Ron, this has been amazing. Thank you so much for coming on, sharing your knowledge with the Small Business Safari. Guys, if you didn't learn something today, that's on you, not on us, man. This has been fun. We've learned a lot of stuff. We've learned a lot about how culture can make a big difference. As they say in the in the biz, man, culture eats strategy for lunch. So let's go make it happen. Get up that mountaintop and make it successful. We're out of here. Cheers, everybody. Thanks, Ron.